Allie Lipscher, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming on. Of course. So what's new? How are you? I'm great. We just finished up our, our season at LMU. Got a little bit of a quote unquote downtime, if you want to call <laughs> it that, before you kind of hit the grind with recruiting and, and all that. And I think last time we saw each other was about almost a year ago in January at the convention. So it feels yes. like a lot of life has been has been lived between a lot then and happened. now. Yeah. A lot has happened since then. And I think so you went from the pro game. Mm -hmm. As the goalkeeper coach at Casey, it was a mm -hmm. Casey Current at the time, or technically no, and technically yes. They like they okay. like branded right at the end of the season, so okay, yeah. And then you went now. You're in the college game mm -hmm. as an assistant coach and a goalkeeper coach yes. at LMU. At LMU, yep. What has that transition been like? Um, it is. I mean, it's been great. Some of it, you know, some of it was professional reasons. Some of it was family reasons, just in terms of getting back to the West Coast. And and so it's been, you know, it's been nice to have. Um, a really nice, I mean, I wouldn't call it a nice balance, but some balance to, you know, to life. It's been, it's been great to kind of work with a level of goalkeeper, a genre of goalkeeper, if you will, that I'm, that I'm really sort of comfortable with mm -hmm. and that, you know, I really enjoy working with, you know, at the end of the day, I love training goalkeepers. I love soccer. You can throw me into just about, you know, any situation that you want to, and you, you give me a good project and I'm, I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. So. Yeah. One thing I always am uh, curious about when you go from the pro game to the college game and then vice versa. Mm -hmm. Let's just say how your situation was when you have goalkeepers in the pro level, mm -hmm. you're exposed to, I guess, better talents mm -hmm. and you're seeing things that you say, wow, whether personality, whether EQ, whether it's yep. uh, technically, tactically, what did, what did you take from KC that maybe now you use for your recruiting as a, from a goalkeeping side, but also to maybe like pointers that you give the goalkeepers throughout the season? Yeah, definitely. And, and that's a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, when you, when you sort of break down the different levels or when you boil down kind of the difference between, you know, whether it's the youth and, or the college or the pro game, what it really boils down to is just the, the margins that you're, that you're working within um, in terms of making a save get smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of the closer to the top that you get. Now I'm sure, you know, at the national team level, it gets even smaller. So, so really when you talk about training a professional goalkeeper versus training you know a college goalkeeper it's just that the the window that you're working within um is more narrow mm -hmm. usually usually there are sort of common factors you know in terms of just athleticism and things like eq and professionalism like everything just kind of streamlined the closer to the top that you get and that changes the way that you train that you approach training and then you know looking at the college game it's I don't want to say it's a different sport, but sometimes it feels like a different sport just because of the way the season is structured yeah. and kind of the numbers of goalkeepers that you have uh, and the level of goalkeepers and the disparity and, and all of those things. It's it, it feels it's it's very, very different because you're working, I would say, in the much with much bigger margins and a much wider lane. Mm. Um, there's upsides to that. There's downsides to that. You know, there's a lot more room for. I guess creativity when you have time to to be creative, you know, in the same in the same thought line, because the season is so short and the games yeah. are so condensed, you don't have a lot of time to be creative. So, yeah. again, it, it's just it's completely it's a completely kind of different setting. Um, but yeah. it is it's really fun. I honestly would look at my college career, and I would tell people that it was instrumental in playing for four years there at Davis because mm -hmm. I felt like, like you're saying, the string of games, sometimes it's Thursday, Saturday, it's Friday, Sunday. Yeah. So the way things are structured, as a goalkeeper, I feel that you can really make leaps and bounds in terms of your improvement and your development because you're playing so many games. Yep. And I think that you finish Thursday's game and you go, wow, as a coach too, you have a good conversation with each other and you say, hey, you could have done this a little bit better, but mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a game on Saturday, so I don't want to throw too much at you, but right. still let's maybe try and uh, add this to the game a little bit. Then comes the Saturday game and it could be a major improvement and you can see them, wow, they really took that information. Yeah. Or you can kind of be like, wow, maybe I as a coach structured that a little bit wrong and yeah. maybe it hindered them a little bit. So have you ever had a moment like that where maybe, like you're saying, you're trying to improve the goalkeeper, but also to, ah, man, I probably shouldn't have said that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think we've all had moments like that, you know, because you're as a as an athlete and a competitor and then, you know, translating that into, into a coach, like mm -hmm. you want to win. So you want to give as much as you can towards winning. And I think, you know, as I've gotten sort of further along in my career as a coach, you you realize um, it's not necessarily about giving all of the information that you can. It's about giving them all the information that they need. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's it's really important not to give a little bit of information because, you know, especially I think in the college game, when you do have a much broader range of EQ and intel and soccer intelligence and all of these things, then, um, you know, really, really kind of trying to 
to really sort of hit the nail on the head in terms of what a goalkeeper needs to take from one game to another when you do have two days and you don't have, you know, you don't have time to get the 75 reps of something that it might take, yeah. um, you know, or even, even more reps if it's like an, an open exposure situation where you just want to create a little bit of unpredictability. So I, I think that, yeah, I, I think it's, there's a, there is a, 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 a skill to be learned as mm-hmm. a coach with, with what information you're giving. Yeah. And I've definitely had situations where just the, the competitor and the person that wants to win inside of me and the person that spent hours watching video, <laughs> you know, wants to give as much information as I can with at the end of the day, like, You've got a goalkeeper who's not necessarily going to make a ton of gain between the, you know, the the Saturday and the, or excuse me, the Thursday and the Saturday game. They might, you know, be able to get sharper in a couple of ways. Yeah. Um, so why overwhelm them with, you know, with all these things? Why not just give them some confidence and let them go in and, and do their thing? Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of the times that's that's much more effective than yeah. than the alternative. Yeah, I think the ego is the enemy from the coaching side oh, sometimes. So much. Yeah, uh, but we, we all have it. Yes, you do. And it's it's you take it for what it for what it is. Mm-hmm. And for example, Chris, who you're working with now, Chris mm-hmm. Shamadi is at LMU. Yep. He was at Cal State LA. I was with him there. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I first came in, it was my I need to prove to this coach that I am worthy of this position. And like I told you, he's a winner. So he has that winner's mentality. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to take on that as well. And during the season, he could see that, hey, man, you know, you're bringing your iPad out, you're you're training the guys, you're filming. Um, But just be careful that, you know, these goalkeepers, we need Alex, who's our starter. We need him to be ready for 22 games this season. And that's Mm -hmm. it. Uh, you can make improvements with everybody else, but I would say try to hold off on some of the critiques and stuff until the uh, until the off season. Yep. So the off season came, and again he told me, but didn't really go into too much depth. It was more of a warning shot. Mm-hmm. And then we had uh, this goalkeeper. I won't say his name, but I he was the Mexican style a little bit, mm-hmm. but raw at making saves. Shot stopping was through the roof. Mm-hmm. Instinctually, he would push and go like I've never seen. Mm-hmm. And that was something that based off of, you know, talking to Phil Wedd and different people, I was kind of just like, all right, well, I, I like the way they're coaching their goalkeeper. So maybe I can influence them uh, with the English style or the American style. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying to get him to make saves, but make sure he parries it in a certain area or prior to a shot. Don't do such crazy prep sets. Mm -hmm. And then after probably like a month of that in the spring, he came to me and said, coach, look, I I don't know what's going on, but ever since you've been trying to instill this new way of playing into me, I have not made any saves Mm -hmm. and I'm conceding a lot more. And that obviously looks terrible in front of Chris and the the coaching staff. Mm -hmm. So I'd prefer if you just let me be me and let me, let me play the way I know how to play. And again, that as a, as a coach, you kind of hear that and you're like, my ego hurts because I'm like, I right. thought I knew what I was doing and yeah. I thought I was supplying you with the information. I'm just trying to help you. Mm-hmm. But then you hear that and you go, oh, man. So I went up to Chris and I said, Chris, this happened to me today. Mm-hmm. And he's like, remember when I told you at the beginning of the season? He always does that. <laughs> I, was like, I told you yeah. and I, it was just a fair, fair warning. But now you're seeing mm-hmm. these players obviously want to get better. So you need to understand, like, is it the right timing? Are you saying it in a concise enough way where they can actually digest the information? Mm hmm. Are you giving them more than they can actually chew on for that moment? Mm -hmm. So all these different things. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about now in terms of the college season not being the best in terms of major gains, but Mm -hmm. maybe marginal. And then it comes down to how you communicate it. Totally. Yeah. And and in the college season, you've got this because you have so many games. If you're starting and playing a lot, you get so much exposure to to game scenarios. Right. And that is so beneficial you know, with, with wherever you are kind of in your development. Um, but if you're not playing in a lot of games and you're not getting that game exposure, yeah, you, you on the other hand, you have a little bit more sort of um, volume that you can train with, um, but you're not getting those game exposures. So like the, the development is happening in sort of like such different, in such different ways between goalkeepers as well. Mm. Yeah. So you grew up in Honolulu. I did. Yeah. Okay. So what was goalkeeping like? What was football like out there? Um, It was at a point where it was just sort of, we were just starting to produce some talent. We were just starting to, you know, bring in coaches from different places to really grow the game. And I was lucky enough to be, you know, at a, at a place where there was some really good coaches coming in and, you know, things like ODP still existed. So I got to, you know, sort of go showcase uh, on a on a national level that I, I don't think I maybe necessarily would have now. And it was really cool and really exciting because we felt like all of a sudden we had sort of been discovered that there was a ton of, you know, girls on my team that went and played D1 soccer. Um, the our, our equivalent on the boys' side of the club won a national championship. Like, it was all of a sudden we were like, oh, wow, we're really good at this. Like, let's, you know, and so that was exciting. And then I got, then I moved across the country and kind of kept going from there. And But but I think that, I think that soccer in Hawaii has continued to grow in a way. You know, the, the club scene and the youth scene is 
has evolved in a million different ways. I don't know yeah. if that's a black hole or a rabbit hole <laughs> that we want to go down. Um, but but I, I do, you know, appreciate that you you are seeing a lot of talent coming out of Hawaii and the talent that you do see is, you know, is really good. You've got the Capri Side Askos, you know, back in the day you had the Natasha Kais and you're just starting to see those players that, that are, you know, really special um, with a little bit more frequency, which it makes me really excited. That's awesome. What, yeah. what were you like as a, as a young goalkeeper? Were you... Uh, oh, just, you had a hunger, you had a hunger for the game or yeah. did, was it kind of like, as you got better, you got a little bit more of an appetite for it? Um, I started playing goalkeeper kind of at the first opportunity and I, there's a, to, to diverge, there's a, there's a podcast. I think it's called the loneliness of the goalkeeper. It's like a radio lab podcast, but it kind of gets into like all these qualities that goalkeepers have, or like these things that you can sort of find and just kind of how, you know, the, it's like this individual position within a team sport. And I was listening to it and I was like, oh, Jesus, that was me. There's a little bit of an ego. You know, I like being good at things. So if I, I was like pretty good as a goalkeeper, I played basketball and volleyball and all these like hand-eye coordination sports. So when I started playing goalkeeper, I was like decently good at it. I was a decent athlete. I'm pretty, I was pretty tall. Like I kind of had all these things fall into favor. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at the end of the day, I just really liked being good at something. So, <laughs> so I took, you know, I took off with it and then, you know, and then you learn the game a little bit more. And then I think, uh, I liked being an athlete and I liked everything that it provided me in my life. And after that, you know, down the road, I really started to fall in love with soccer. But I was, I mean, I was a pain in the ass. I was a rowdy kid. I was a perfect <laughs> candidate for a goalkeeper because I was going to do, you know, whatever it took. I'm sure I was very unorthodox in all of my, <laughs> in all of my techniques, but it was, yeah, it was a good fit for me. Well, you were good enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to a top school like Duke. Mm -hmm. So I think there is some validity to uh, you as a goalkeeper. So I guess the big conversation nowadays mm -hmm. is should goalkeepers specialize at a young age yeah. or should they play different sports? And I feel, mm -hmm. I think with your situation and even you look at like Rafa Nadal, for example, mm -hmm. didn't play tennis until he was, I think, 13 or 14. Yeah, great example. So you, you know, I'm saying he played soccer for the majority of his life. So mm -hmm. Um, for you, what, what kind of a goalkeeper were you though? Like what were some things that you yeah. can say, wow, Duke is taking interest in me because of this and this? Mm, I was a shot stopper and I was very aggressive. Eventually, like I was exposed to some of the technical sides of goalkeeping, but I was just, I was super athletic. You know, I think that one of my, it might not be a great example for a lot of reasons, but one of like my favorite quote unquote goalkeepers that I sort of latched onto at a really young age was Bruce Gravelar mm. going way back. I know. <laughs> um, but he sort of took the position from, you know, these, these, it, it kind of went from being a position where you just stuck the biggest guy in there because he took up the most space to being really athletic. Mm. And I know there's a lot of other history that comes along with him, but I think that you started to see someone who just loved flying around and making saves and kind of, it was, there was a, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a chip on your shoulder about it. And I think that really kind of embodies like, you know, how, how I liked to play when I was a kid. I was just, I was just an athlete and then soccer kind of fell in and I, and, and I started to mold myself around the position after that. Yeah. And Duke is again, not a small establishment. So what yeah. was that like coming into to campus when you're, I mean, so you, you said you moved from Honolulu to, was there like a, a period in between there where you moved somewhere else? So say for so you moved straight from there. College, yeah. Okay. Straight to college. Family so what was still in Hawaii. I just, yeah, I just kind of moved across the country to go to college. It was, it was great. It was a huge culture shock. You know, you, you grow up in a small place. I grew up on a rock literally. So like I was being exposed to all these things and I had to do a lot of, of growing up and learning. And, and that was fantastic for me. And it was a, it was a great environment. You know, Robbie was my coach and he's still the coach there now. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a consistency in what, you know, they can bring and kind of a level that they really strive for that, that I loved. I mean, they, it, it provided me obviously such a great education and a place to, to really grow. And I had, you know, I think every goalkeeper kind of has one goalkeeper coach that, yeah. that really stands out to them when they think of like their goalkeeper coach. And my goalkeeper coach was a guy named Nate Kip that I had in college. And he really, you know, gave me the tools and the confidence and the structure to, to I think, take my career to, to where it eventually went that I wouldn't have necessarily done without that. So mm. yeah, I'm really thankful for my time there. Do you coach similar to the way you like to be coach? Uh, I did. At first did. I did. Yeah, I did. And as I've, as I've grown, I have found myself kind of able to, I, because I think that all comes back to ego, right? Like you, because if you, if you're coaching the way you like to be coached, then you're taking sort of what worked for you and trying to apply it to someone else. And I think that I have become, I don't want to say hands off, but much more observant in my coaching and really trying to take the time to figure out what's going to help him or her, whoever, um, kind of succeed at whatever the task is that we have in front of us. So I think that I did for a long time, I was very high energy. You know, I, I sort of coached the way that I played um, and I've become sort of much more quiet and much more calm in my coaching and, and really just intentional about about what I'm saying to a player and what I'm bringing to a training session. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of been my biggest growth as, as a coach. Has that been through trial and error? Is Absolutely. That, yeah. So like you've had mistakes where you just said, you know, what, I need to dial this back or they're not 
Totally. Yeah, totally. And I think you see that. I mean, so I coach at literally every level, you know, the, the youth and I still do youth coaching and college and obviously at the pro level, but there are sessions. And I think you see it a, a lot at the youth level because that's the hardest age to coach where you're trying to get something across and you're trying to set something up or whatever it is, a drill. And just at the end of the session, you're like, shit, that didn't, that nothing about that worked. <laughs> and you sort of have to be, you know, you, um, you can you can be pissed for however long, but at the end of the day, like their kids, they're going to go home and eat their macaroni and cheese and, and move on with their <laughs> lives, right? Yeah. So you kind of have to figure out, all right, so, so what do I do? You know, how do I how do I make sure that, that I do this better next time? And I, I appreciate the youth game because it is so difficult. You have to be really good at coaching to be able to develop young goalkeepers in really good ways, right? Yeah. Like you, can, you can give kids great spaces and, you know, you can create great environments and they're going to succeed because they're in a good environment. But like the, like the actual, like the technical growth and the tactical growth of players takes a lot of effort and and it's really hard at the youth level so i i appreciate it for that but yeah i have i i'm, I'm a trial by error person i'm you know <laughs> i'm a hit my head against the wall seven times before i figure out that the door is next to the wall and i just walk through it kind of a person so i've certainly yeah. had you know that's certainly how i i have i have developed as a goalkeeper coach and it sucks i wish i could be more cerebral and just sit back <laughs> and think about it but that's kind of who i am yeah no it's a, it's the truth though i think when you work with young goalkeepers i have i kind of realized that i lack a lot of patience but when you extract yourself and back up from the situation and you realize okay this is what ali brings to the table as a goalkeeper how can i improve her then mm -hmm. you really have to dissect and then structure the game plan for them and i felt like when i work with some younger goalkeepers it was on a private uh, basis so mm -hmm. i would see them one-on-one -on -one and maybe not see them for another two weeks because they were traveling and all that so i never really had to structure it in a way that i made it digestible for them if that makes mm -hmm. sense and then i started to work with i think cal state la but then some guys and girls that were coming a little bit more often mm -hmm. and a goalkeeper coach commented on one of my maybe subliminally not on my my channel but she mm -hmm. was like you need to create sessions specifically for the goalkeeper mm -hmm. not so much just put a session on for every single like if you have four sessions in a day every goalkeeper from one to four they all get the same session but then sure. i really thought about it i was like wow that's so true why am i running the same session for ali that i would for somebody else mm -hmm. if you guys have completely unique styles yeah. and i think that's where i kind of had to mature a little bit and i said wow i'm taking the easy way out and to the detriment of the kids that i'm coaching mm -hmm. and the parents the kids they're going to listen to you because you're the expert in that position sure but at the end of the day, if you really want to see growth mm -hmm. as a coach, you have to realize and kind of let that rec reconcile with it for a second and be like, yeah. OK, I'm recognizing my shortcomings here. Totally. And it's hard. And that's and that's kind of like that's an investment in yourself, because at the end of the day, it takes a long time to develop a good session. Right. And if you're yeah. doing four of those in a day and you're making however <laughs> much money you're making off it, you're kind of making pennies on the dollar with like hours that you're putting into it. So it is it's hard. Um, and, you know, you, if, if you feel comf like comfortable and confident with, you know, whether it's a drill or whether it's a session or the structure or the flow of it, then there's also value to be said about being able to, you know, deliver a session with with confidence as well. So you're always trying to find that balance between, yeah. you know, making sure that everything is tailored specifically and making sure that you're putting forward a, a good sort of edited, if you will, session. Yeah. There's a balance in it. There is. Yeah. And um, for you at, at Duke, you were freshman year, were you a starter? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I started off four years. Really? Yeah. Okay. I was lucky. I was, the timing, the timing, you know, was right and I was able to come in and yeah, I was able to start off four years. That's a big undertaking though. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I think I was dumb enough not to be too, <laughs> you know, not to be too, uh, uh, I don't know, phased by it. Yeah. yeah. I think naive naivete like it's it's yeah. it's such an underrated skill to have yes we talk about i talk about abraham it was like ignorance is bliss and mm -hmm. sometimes when you're unaware of the situation and the scenario like we had rivalries in college and in high school and i was mm -hmm. like you know coming into the school I'm like, okay that's cool like i don't really know who these teams are but yep. sure there's a rivalry yep. and then you play against them a few times and then like by your senior year you go oh crap okay this is a big game i gotta yeah. change everything up yeah yeah i got scored on by some really good players that are still <laughs> on the national team when i was in college and i had no idea right like it's yeah. you just go in there there is yeah ignorance is bliss in a lot of ways and so f freshman year now you're being touted as you know the starter at they were acc from day mm -hmm. one okay so at a top acc school what was that experience like coming from maybe a smaller town and something that maybe is now this is such a brand new experience yeah yeah i mean I, I you know i had some exposure to regional teams and youth national teams and and things like that so i had a little bit of a taste of it again i was so naive like so i i think that I was, I, I loved my experience. I loved the, that I was getting goalkeeper training every day. You know, I loved mm -hmm. that I was working out every day. And I, 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 like, I really, really am just, it was such a good fit for me. And I really embraced the situation. So 
I don't, I don't, I remember being nervous for games because I was always, I've always been someone who gets nervous for games and gets nervous for big moments. I'm, I was kind of a training goalkeeper. Like mm. I love the grind of the work. There was a comfort in that for me. And then, you know, getting over the hurdle of being able to apply that in the game was always something that, um, not necessarily that I struggled with, but I mean, maybe struggled with, but then had to like really just work to like apply. Um, so, and, and that was consistent from youth to college to pro to now in like a professional environment. So I think that, you know, it was, it was a great experience for me. We did really well my freshman year. We had a great team. We had, you know, I had, I had, there was so many other players in the team that were so good that it wasn't like I was holding up the team yeah. by any means. So I had opportunities to fail in really safe ways. Um, I had opportunities to succeed in really great ways. Um, and it was, yeah, it was fantastic. I think that's a really good point there, like failing in safe ways. Mm -hmm. I think those are experiences that I've had where sometimes my mistakes were a little too costly. Mm -hmm. I remember academy days where I made a mistake in the academy playoffs. And mm -hmm. now everyone who was trying to showcase to their college teams, all my teammates looking at me kind of like, dude, you just ruined this for us. Right, right, right. And so I think if you can, yeah, if you can fail in, in the safe environments and then have the people around you to kind of like pick you up. But um, as a coach, how is your communication style with goalkeepers? Do you help them see those side of things of like, hey, it was a mistake, but we're going to learn from it and we're going to make it so it's not too much of an expensive mistake? Yeah. Or are you kind of like, look, I'm being blunt. This is the reality of the situation. I think I try to throw a line for both. I think I tend to be, I, I tend to try to create safe spaces for goalkeepers to fail. Um, you know, I, I think if, if I've had to, I think the pendulum has swung really pretty far in that direction. I think that, you know, now even more recently, I'm starting to, to find the balance to, um, y you want to create safe spaces. You don't want to give players an excuse not to get better. So I'm trying, you know, trying to, trying to be like, okay, like, Hey, this is fine that this happened, but like, let's see if we can maybe not let it happen again. And here's how we're going to do that. Like, this is, here's a thought, here's a couple of exercises. Let's, let's get some reps. Like, no, this rep didn't go this way because, you know, because of this. And then just being really, really intentional is the word that I kind of keep coming back to about, yeah, creating those spaces, but also, making sure that those spaces are moving in the right direction. No, that's a great point. What's your yeah. ratio of how much you talk during a session to the, the goalkeepers? Oh my gosh, it's gone so down. Um, I used to just be nonstop, I'm sure so annoying. And I, <laughs> and I am still pretty chatty, but it's a lot more like the, yep, okay, next one, move on. And mm -hmm. not so much like, okay, stop, pause. Like, let's break this down sort mm -hmm. of a thing. There's, you know, occasionally, I think there's a good time and place for that. But I think I, I tend to be, I tend to, I chirp. A lot um you know i like to kind of stay engaged i like goalkeepers to be engaged i get excited about things and i tend to talk more i think that you know if you're just if you're doing reps at anything as a goalkeeper there needs to be something kind of quote unquote realistic about it so even just like a little vocal cue makes it that much more realistic to what would be happening in a game yeah. than just like the silence of someone like shuffling and setting and catching <laughs> it's shuffling and setting and catching you know what i mean yeah, yeah. it takes like you said a lot of repetitions it takes so much confidence to allow the session to run yeah and then also that trust factor between you and the goalkeepers and again dan ball who we just had on mm -hmm. he had a good point where he's like the thing i love about being a goalkeeper coach is the ratio of it's four to one so it's you have a really intimate relationship with each person you really know what their values are you really mm -hmm. get to know um, where they stand on visual cues verbal cues totally. and how they want to be spoken to um, so for you is is that something that you really enjoy about the the coaching position yeah absolutely I think you know there is you, you you get to form relationships with with people and kind of learn them in a way that you don't in a team setting which is really really valuable and also like really important and something that you have to be you know really aware of because it's something that if you don't value it and you don't treat people in the right way or you don't take the time to kind of learn someone's learning style kind of like you know what, what you were talking about with um the goalkeeper that you had at cal state la like it yeah. it can go sideways so i think it's an important thing to be you know to be able to have an emotional intelligence about um and a goalkeeper and coach intelligence about yeah. if you want to call it that yeah, yeah. that's when i think my biggest hurdle that i've had to cross mm -hmm. is because i'm a very impatient person mm -hmm. i kind of like to have my relationship let's say you and i are very close and we've worked together I kind of assume that within a few conversations, I'm going to be able to have that same relationship with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then it's that lack of, oh, it's not even awareness, but the patience aspect where I'm like, these things happen so um, organically mm -hmm. that now you're trying to force the situation and that trust can't be built. Mm -hmm. And then maybe now I'm going to start questioning how I'm communicating and how I'm delivering my message when in reality, give it a few more weeks or even the full yeah. season. Sometimes everybody's a little bit different in how yeah. they allow people to come into their lives. Yeah. But then that trust factor is built. And then now I'm not questioning what I'm saying and all that because I have that just like, I don't know, 
more of an awareness of like I'm talking to somebody that, that trusts me and I trust them. And it's very easy not to question yourself when you have that, uh, that layer. Yeah. There's a wisdom and an experience to, to that versus just kind of an intelligence about what you're saying for yeah. sure. And it's, and it's important. It's important for development in any, you know, in any arena with any sport, with any coach or teacher or what have you. But it, it because, yeah, because there is an intimacy to just to the ratios that you are yeah. training goalkeepers with, it's really important. Mm. So you don't really have two. Did you have a ton of expectations going into college though that like I want to come in and compete or were you still that ignorance is bliss of like, oh, OK, it's a big school. I'm, I'm coming in and we'll see what happens. No, I wanted to come in and compete. And there's a rally like, you know, you sort of I knew that there was a senior graduating and I know that you know, I knew that they were investing money in me. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that there was, you know, an understanding of sorts. But if I don't have a full grasp on someone, I'm kind of someone who's going to be like, F it. Here we go. Let's, let's see what happens. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll understand it when I'm in it. Yeah. And I think that I was able to take that approach to, you know, my my playing. Mm. yeah four years you guys were i think you guys made the ncaa tournament every year mm-hmm. one sweet 16 one elite eight couple sweet 16s one elite eight yeah okay yeah yeah and then after do you have aspirations to play pro or i did there wasn't a league yet um there was a gap year between when uh when i graduated from college and then when the wps started which was the iteration before the nwsl so i actually moved out to la and i was playing for a team out here in um the WPSL, yeah, mm-hmm. which is which was awesome. You know, a, one of my teammates from college was out here. I was just doing like the the starving artist thing, working a bunch of jobs and playing as much soccer as I could, and <laughs> and surfing on the weekends, which was great. Um, and living in LA and and all the things. And and then when the WPS started up, I was I wasn't drafted actually. Um, I was asked to to come in as a trial player for the Boston Breakers, and I went out and and I made the team there. I spent a couple of years in Boston. I played internationally in Australia for a couple of seasons. That was kind of when the seasons were a little bit shorter, so you could do both. Um, so I was able to play here and then jump over to a season kind of during the winter months in Australia. So I just had perpetual summer for like two <laughs> years, which was really fun. And then when the league shut down. I kind of, you know, I kind of had to look around and I was like, I'm making $12,000 a year. You know, mm. I'm about to lose my, get off my parents' health insurance. <laughs> like I need to kind of figure something else out, which is, un- which is unfortunate, but it also let me step into coaching, you know, at like 25, 26. Mm. So I've had, I've now had, you know, 10 years of, of kind of coaching in various, in various arenas under my belt, which, which, you know, from a professional aspect, I do really appreciate. Yeah. Uh, every player or pro player that I've had on, they've always talked about kind of like that crossroads in their life Mm -hmm. where you can look at it as glass half empty or glass half full. Totally. And it sounds like with the coaching journey now, Mm -hmm. you've kind of taken it as glass half full. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Like I'm someone that needs to learn, you know, from experience and and that's not always the quickest way Mm -hmm. to learn is because you got to go through it. So I've had a lot of different coaching experiences. Um, I've coached in a lot of in different divisions in, you know, the college game, different places in the youth game, different areas. I've lived in every area of the country. And so I've had a lot of really, really great experiences that I think, you know, when I look back at it have, have been really formative to me that I'm really, really thankful for. But, you know, it's at the time you're like, I wish I was still playing. You know, you see the NWSL start and you're like, man, that would have been cool. Or, you know, there's, it's always easy to look back and think about what if, but I'm really for, I'm really happy that, you know, everything kind of turned out the way that it did. Yeah. From what I hear, you are a great coach. So I'm oh, just, I'm going to let you know you. that now. So you probably made a good decision to uh, get a head start that. on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, What was that, I guess, transition of levels from the college game now, you're going to the pro game and yeah. was it similar? I think you said something about like a lot of international players now and it's, yeah. Styles. Yeah. 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 No, it was. It, there was a jump for sure. And there was a whole year in between where I was literally just training on my own at a field in El Segundo with a bunch of other people <laughs> that were sort of thinking about trying to go pro or were playing, you know, semi pro at the time. So there was a big there was a big jump all of a sudden, you know, I, I came into the Boston Breakers and I was a little bit pissed that I didn't get drafted. I kind of felt like, you know, I Slided. don't know. Yeah. We all have egos for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went in with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, but also with that same sort of like naivety where I'm like, F it, like. I think I'm good at this. Let's just see how good I can be. And then ended up ended up getting signed, but was playing behind Kristen Luckenbill, who was, you know, a former national team goalkeeper. So there's, you know, when you talk about like the jump in levels, like you're you're seeing everything. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, me and a soccer ball on a wall at El Segundo. All of a sudden, like you're in a <laughs> training environment with, you know, with Kristen Luckenbill and a, and a great goalkeeper coach and and all these things. So it was it was a big jump in level, but. I loved it. it. You know, it was incredible. You get to you get to play soccer, and it was at a time you know when women's soccer certainly didn't have you know the the fame and fortune that it does now. So you yeah. you're you're really grateful for it because you're like there's something you know, I get to do something. Um, so you're kind of just grateful for whatever you have. Did you feel like you were a part of something that was gaining traction, or were you guys still in those moments, kind of like, damn, this is really what the professional life is? Or because I've heard it's a little bit it was unglamorous for a long time, and even yeah. now it's still not amazing. Sure, but still, I think 
the early players, they kind of had to realize that they were in it for something bigger than themselves. Yeah, no, I, I thought that, I mean, I thought that I had, had made it. I, you know, I walked into the locker room and Tony DeChico is my coach and <laughs> Christine Lilly is sitting, you know, two, two lockers down from me. And I don't think I said anything for like a week. I was just so intimidated <laughs> by everything. But no, I, I loved it. And, 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 you know, you can, I think that it's, it's important to be able to see things out of a couple lenses. Like I think I was so thankful for it. Uh, and I'm also so thankful that I was able to step back and like, kind of you know see that I think it wasn't as good as it could be or should be or we're slighted in some ways and also be part of like building it towards what it is now and and I think that it's important to to be able to hold both things because you don't you don't want you know you sort of <laughs> it's hard not to, to jump back into like the well when I was a player we had to you know mentality yeah. you want you want players to want more you want people to push for you know for more money and more airtime and all those things that that they do deserve we're seeing you know we're seeing the the end result of that now I think so, you know, on one hand, I was really thankful for, for what I had. Uh, and on the other hand, I'm, I'm so thankful it's not what it was. Yeah. Wow. That's a great point. Um, so from your playing career now, again, mm-hmm. you're transitioning to coaching at a younger age. What were your thoughts on coaching? Yeah. Like, was it a completely different world? For, for example, for me, it was I can apply all the same, the hard work and the attention to detail. But now with the lens, through the lens of, of coaching. So how was that transition for you? Was it easy? Was it hard? Or? It was easy because I wasn't great at it to start. I thought it was, here's, you know, here's what I know. I'm just going to tell these goalkeepers what I know and try mm. to get them to do what I know is right and what works. And that's, you know, I think I didn't have a lot. That, the, I think the goalkeeping uh, mentorship and conference, even like podcasts are our mentorship in a way, just hearing people talk about goalkeeping, like we didn't have that, right? So you're sort of you're sort of just put on the field with you know your cleats and a handful of balls and said coach and and so I tried to do that as best as I could but I was just coaching what I knew and it took you know it took the last 10 years for me to really sort of evolve in a way where I've been able to develop as a coach not just a former player who knows about goalkeeping yeah. um, and I think that's a transition within itself what did you hold as like your gold standard at 25 from the mm. coaching side and what do you like look back on and go wow that was something that i really from a personal yeah, i yeah. guess preference as what you saw from the goalkeepers but also to something that may have an experience that may have changed the way you see maybe how you coach and how you want to develop the goalkeeper yeah i think a lot of that i saw everything that i understood like physically as a goalkeeper like i thought like that was the best that i had to offer was being like look how I make this save or like listen to how I think this save should be made. And then let's try to do that. Here's how I think this should look. Now I'm going to try to get you to do so this. So it looks how I think it should look. Mm. And I thought like my ability to do that was kind of what I brought. And at the end of the day, like I think communication is 99% of, of coaching. I think that if you can communicate something, I think, well, I think maybe, maybe not 99%. I think understanding the players that you're working with and understanding what they want and what you want and what the, the, the best end result is and being able to communicate with them in a way that gets them as close to they can is that end result. That's really what coaching is. And I think that that's really what has, has changed and, and developed and grown for me, mm-hmm. you know, in my time as a goalkeeper coach is just being able to, to uh, look and listen and learn and, and want to develop and want to, you know, change my understanding. I'm, I'm coaching things now that I didn't do as a player. And I think when you get to a point where you can do that and you see someone excel in those areas, you're like, okay, like that, that feels good. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it's, I'm not just coaching something that I knew because I knew how to do it. Like I'm coaching something that I've come to understand and I've learned. Um, and now I'm able to communicate it in a way that allows you to do it as well. Yeah. I think it's the continued development that mm-hmm. sometimes you're so caught up in the daily life and the daily I guess attention to detail for that goalkeeper and you try and package it in a way for them but then as you kind of take a step back you're like wow me even trying to package this information in a very succinct way for this Mm -hmm. player it's creating a skill set for myself as well totally yeah Yeah. absolutely is a skill set yeah we're I mean we're just trying to give we're trying to give players tools right Mm -hmm. like everyone's got a belt we're trying to give them tools but you've got to be you know sharpening your own tools as well yeah Yeah. an interesting topic I I came up with one of Armando who I had earlier Mm -hmm. we were discussing how sometimes you can kind of get pigeonholed into the system that you're in as a coach, but mainly as a player. Mm-hmm. And for example, at Davis, I told a story about my coach kind of saying, hey, like you're good at shot stopping. We have tall guys. Don't worry about crosses. We'll take care of that. And you kind of, for a second, take your eye off that mm-hmm. and you recognize, oh, wow. Okay. Well, if I'm not, I'm okay at not being good or uh, being commanding because mm-hmm. I don't need to be. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of step into the pro game or pro trials and you're starting to recognize, wow, because I took my foot off the gas in that skill or in that tool, in my toolbox, mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's very dull. It's not sharpened like it should have been. And then you kind of fall back a little bit because you're not really of use to as many coaches. You kind of start making uh, yeah. it's more of a narrow pathway. Mm-hmm. So you think that's something that whether it's at KC or I think you were U of A, University of Minnesota, mm-hmm. like you were at these different different places where we have a style. However, I'm also noticing that you have more potential. So don't lose sight on these other skills. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I keep, I keep using the word balance because I do think, you know, it's such a, it's such an important word that exists where, you know, if you're, you know, you, you had a coach tell you like, you know, don't worry about crosses. We've got taller players, all those things. Like there's information in that, that, that is important. Like, okay, like here's how I need to understand, you know, if I'm in a situation where I, I I need to understand my range. I need to understand my crossing ability. I want to make it better for sure. But if I'm in a game situation, I'm not, that's not maybe the time where I'm really trying to make it better. That's maybe a time where I'm trying not to get scored on. So how do I develop the tools of communication or recognition or scan, whatever it is to make sure that in a game situation, I'm as effective and efficient as I can possibly be. And then, you know, as a, as a coach, it's your job. And as a player, it's your job as well to take responsibility over over the development and moving moving that needle wherever kind of it needs to move. Maybe yeah. making your range bigger, maybe making your communication better, maybe making your your recognition or decision making. You know, moving that in a direction where it needs to move. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the the thing we can get kind of get caught up in because of the quick succession of games, mm-hmm. and we're not really looking at the development side anymore it's more wins and losses yeah. it can kind of turn into that yeah and um we had a season last year we had a goalkeeper alex rando who's at nycfc now but we had him and then obviously towards the end of the season we're realizing okay we've probably lost like 20 games now we're not going to make the playoffs mm-hmm. so i pulled him aside and i said look you know at the end of the day we can look at this this season and cry about it and be upset about it and or we can kind of say look these there's 10 games left what are some things and goals that you want to try or take from what you've worked on on, on the training ground to the game and how can we apply it? Mm-hmm. We had a very serious conversation. He was like, like, I want to try this a little bit more, try to you know, hit some goal kicks on my left a little, a little bit more and, and apply that. And I think that was something that I learned as a coach where I said, wow, I could really cry and sulk over the fact that the season's lost or we can use it as an opportunity to say, okay, what are some things that you've showcased in training that I can give you the full confidence and then speak to the head coach and say, I gave him, I, I wanted him to have yeah. the green light there. Have you ever had any of those moments where you kind of said, hey, I've seen it in training, go for it, let's see. Totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think what you're saying is, is, is it speaks to the fact that there's always, there's always sort of two types of, there's always two things going on, right? You're always, you always want to win the game. So there's always kind of that priority um, and where you are in your season, it's, there's that priority. And then there's like the long-term development and both of those things are kind of happening. And, you know, during season one kind of takes precedent during the off season, the other sort of takes precedent. And so being able to, you know, being able to manage those. And like you were saying, maybe being able to sort of navigate maybe when that priority can shift a little bit and you actually are going to get more out of your long-term development. If you give someone a little bit more freedom and, and take a little bit more risk, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what you're opening up in a game. Yeah, that's, that's definitely happened. I've, I've definitely been on teams where you get to a point in the season, you're like, all right, well, we know what, we know how this is going to end and it's not in the championship match. So, you know, how do we, how do we maybe shift our focus a little bit to a, make sure that we're helping you. I think, I think what you, what you did with, with your goalkeeper was helping them compartmentalize in a way where you're not just staring at this big picture that has a lot of of losses in it. Cause that's hard. And that gets heavy, especially for a goalkeeper, being able to compartmentalize in, in a way that allows you to focus on something smaller that you have more control over that you can experience more success within is really, really important because, because a, you know, you're, you're checking some of that long-term development. Um, you're checking a, some more of those boxes, but you're also, you're also allowing someone to experience a, a success and, 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 and give them an environment where success is happening. Maybe when you zoom out that it isn't happening in, in the same way. So I think that's a great skill, you know, so, to be able to yeah. have, we, yeah. need to, we need to cultivate that as coaches. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, how can I carve, uh, out a piece of the season and, and present it in a way that it looks like success overall. Mm-hmm, totally. Yeah. And then one thing you did say that I liked was kind of like the compartmentalizing. Tell me about a time in your life where okay. you've had that kind of like a little bit of a failure, I would say, mm. uh, whether it's coaching, playing, mm-hmm. but then you've kind of learned that skill and refined the skill of uh, compartmentalizing. So I, okay. So I played uh, my last season in the WPS was with the Atlanta beat. We were not good. We came in last. We won one game. And I think that, you know, there was a period of time where I was starting and I was playing and um, 
we we just kept losing and and I started playing poorly like I was letting you know nerves and lack of success and like all my confidence was just at an all-time low and you know at, at the, what happens at the professional level is you get pulled and that's just kind of a reality of it but I was able to kind of I I was I was still young I was whatever I was 24 but I was able to sort of go back to what was a safer space for me with training and really just even having a little bit more room to breathe and like really being able to dial in a lot of a lot of where I started to fail was in my decision making whether it was you know taking I remember just taking too long on a distribution there was a there was a very specific place one of those things you'll never forget where I got a back pass I knew what the simple decision was um, and I knew what kind of like the quote-unquote wrong decision was and I and I went for it anyway and I tried to hit a ball with my left foot at a time when you know I wasn't confident enough with my left foot and I hit it straight to Abby Wambach and she just took a touch and buried it on me <laughs> but those moments you know stay with you and and I was able to in kind of you know being being put back on the bench I was able to spend a lot of time working on my left foot and I was able to take these these moments like these goals that I was like I made a bad decision here and really kind of have time to look at them from a safe distance and compartmentalize them in ways where I could go back to you know what I felt safe with which was just the grind of the work and making sure that you know, I got a thousand reps in something because if I get a thousand reps in something, I'm going to be able to take it into the game. It's kind of that transition that we talked about early in the podcast, mm-hmm. take it into a game and feel so much more confident with it. I want, you know, I want my product to be polished and finished. And that's kind of how I've always been as, a, as how I was as a player. So just, you know, in that failure and, and having a little bit more space to to break things down on a smaller level and not having to look at them with so you know holistically yeah I think I was definitely able to start to you know start to turn around and then I went you know to Australia and had a great season in Australia and felt like I was kind of playing at the top of my game you know for for a while there so I think it's in the trenches Mm -hmm. where you start to figure out how to get yourself out of those things and I think these skill sets really go a long way as coaches as well and I don't I don't know whether we know it or not or like those stories come into your head in the moments where a goalkeeper who you just had to pull or had that honest conversation mm-hmm. and tell them, hey, you're going to be on the bench for the next few games. We're going to yeah. go with the, the hot hand now. Mm-hmm. But those like stories, they kind of come out of nowhere and you kind of go, oh, man, I need to deliver a message to her to say, look, this time it could be unproductive where you're sulking and you're upset mm-hmm. or we can realize, hey, you can, you can ask me or you can realize, hopefully mm-hmm. they come to you, but yeah. say, hey, like, what did I do wrong? What could I improve? I think from the emotional intelligence side, I spoke to Dan about it and mm-hmm. I think that's, that's such an underrated skill. Yeah. And do you feel like that failure or maybe other failures that have happened to you in your, in your career kind of shape the way you, you bottle messages or kind of... Uh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, what, what I have learned is if a player trusts you and a player knows you and you are transparent and you are honest um, and you are consistent, I think that's a really important word, then you can deliver that message in a way that allows them to be like, just allows them to hear it and digest it in a way that they wouldn't if, if they don't trust you or if you've been inconsistent. And I was inconsistent because, you know, in early in my career because I was impatient and I was all these things and I and my ego was taking precedent you know and I didn't have the skill set of communication and all these things but you know I, I've learned that with establishing that relationship you're able you're just you're able to have hard conversations if, if you don't know me or I've been you know I've responded kind of erratically to to training and and one day like I don't say anything and one day I'm saying you know a million things but you can't really you don't really understand why then when I come to you and I'm like you know Omar I'm sorry like you're, you're not going to start you're you don't you don't trust me you don't no. know me like you don't you don't have any context for what i'm saying mm-hmm. so you're gonna handle it a lot differently and maybe not take advantage of the space that you know we are creating for you but if you do i can say to you you know in a way like hey you're not starting right now and then here's a plan because you know we've had conversations before and there's always a plan and there's always a reason here's a plan for how we're going to approach this time and, and all of a sudden you've got a much different you know a much different week month whatever it is kind of ahead of you that's one thing with chris he always mm-hmm. talked about, he said it from like the player's perspective, like you guys, we can't blink and <laughs> don't blink is something that I try to um, implement as a coach. And one thing he also said was be undeniable yeah. for me. I'll tell you quickly how it's that for me. It was yeah, yeah. no matter what you do, you always have to understand that the players are watching, um, whether you're being consistent or mm-hmm. inconsistent with your messaging on and off the field. When you show up to the field, you need to be on time. The session needs to be ready and planned. It needs yep. to be structured that gives you leeway to make adjustments. But if you're not and the players see that, 
there's a in the armor there a little bit when yep. they kind of realize, okay, coach is not really on his game today. So for you, what does that mean to be undeniable? And, and I guess the way you carry yourself as a coach. Yeah, totally. And and that's something you know that you know he he still says it is still a big part of of his philosophy. And for me, it's it's just that consistency. There's you know, there's consistency and then there's honesty because at the end of the day, like, you know, we're humans and yes, my sessions are planned out and yes, they're intentional, but no, they don't always go, you know, it's a plan. But if, if they are consistently honest and planned out and I'm consistent in the way that I, you know, approach them and I'm, and I give them, you know, just those two to three bits of information beforehand, like, Hey, here's kind of what you can expect on the day. And then mm-hmm. every day they get what, what I said they can expect. Then if I come into a session and it's not really going to plan, I'm like, Hey, this isn't going to plan. Like, here's what I think, like, let's adjust in this way. We good? We're good. Okay, let's go. That happens as a result of, and we, I know we keep coming back to it, but just me like putting down my ego and not being like, this isn't, you know, this isn't going the way I want it to go. So like, here's how I'm like, let's just keep going forward and driving through this. Or like, here's just this radical adjustment we're going to take or like, like we're done, we're, whatever yeah. it is. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's so important. I do. I think consistency and continuity and just the steadiness is so, so, so important. And I think that those are things that are really important as a goalkeeper as well. So if I can, if I can convey that as a coach and I'm not erratic and I'm not reactive, then I think that's a great example to set just overall for the goalkeepers that I'm training. Yeah. You said earlier the balance aspect of like balancing the emotions and balancing mm-hmm. all those things. And if you can't be a good example of it, how, how can you expect your goalkeepers to totally. yeah, listen to what you have to say? Um, I do want to tap into your ego a little bit, though. Please. Because every, 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 yeah. <laughs> every coach has it. So what can you tell me from the technical and tactical is your best asset? And then from the emotional intelligence side as well, what is something that you feel you can kind of hang your hat on and say, man, I'm really good at this and I've really improved over time? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, as I think that from a technical side, I have really been intentional about trying to figure out what makes goalkeepers efficient. And I think that, you know, I, I what I've what I've really tried to do is I have tried to let goalkeepers make a save however they're gonna make the save. You know, at the end of the day, like if your hands are behind the ball in a good shape and you have a good catching ability, you're gonna catch it. So how your hands get there, yeah, there's more efficient ways to do it. But if I can if I can get a goalkeeper going from a balanced position where they have a lot of ground contact um, and an ability to maximize their own efficiencies, then they're, they're probably going to make a save whether or not, you know, I want them getting lower and shooting, you know, shooting lower. I think, you know, you mentioned, or I saw something recently where do you shoot from below the ball? Do you shoot at ball level? Like something like that. Right. Like, and, and I kind of was like, yeah, I can understand where the efficiency is in those two things, but if I've got a goalkeeper that it's going to take longer to get lower because of who they are and that's going to unbalance them, that's a word that I've really sort of have honed into, then they're not going to make that save as, as consistently as they would if I if I just help them get to a point where they're balanced. And a lot of that, it's nuanced. A lot of that for me has come from like, are your eyes moving, right? Is your head moving? Can Can we get you to a place where you are still? What does that mean for how your hands move? And just kind of being really intentional about learning individuals and getting them to a place where they're able to maximize their skill set. And mm-hmm. then and then from there you I think that, you know, looking at looking at, at people's height and athleticism and power and being like, okay, like you've got this tool, it's not very sharp. How do we sharpen it a little bit? At the end of the day, if I, you know, if I get someone pushing off, you know, their front leg instead of their back leg or getting a really good quick transition from their back to front leg um, on their dive, but they're not starting from a balanced position, then you're losing your, I mean, it's completely null and void. So that's something that that I've really cued in on and, and keyed in on and I think is really important that I value. And I think that I've spent a lot of time and, and gotten, you know, to a place where where I'm able to help keepers develop with that in a really good way. And, and I've and I've seen it work and that feels good talking, you know, talking about your ego. So I think that, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what I would hang my hat on um, on the technical side of things from the tactical side of things I've we'll go off on a tangent a little bit but like I, I work in the women's game I've, I've worked on the men's side you know a, a bit but I've mostly worked in the women's game um, and on the tactical side of things what I bring is just an understanding of soccer and a love of soccer and wanting to learn about you know about the game and understanding how different cultures you know play in different why one country style is different from another country style so from a tactical standpoint I am still honing in the ability just to get uh, players to start watching more soccer at a younger age and learning from the game in ways that I was able to learn from the game because I fell in love with it and you know I, I wanted all of it I wanted to watch Bruce Grabelar on VHS <laughs> and things like that yeah and and you know I think that my uh 
my uh, whatever you want to call it you know my journey right now is is really just trying to expose kids or expose players and women uh, that I'm coaching to the game in a way that makes it accessible and trying to let them learn like giving them a tool so that they can maximize their own development and their yeah. own growth um, you know because I can I can tell you the cue to look for in a wing back if you're going to spring the ball you know wide on a play um, but if you see Tottenham do it all of a sudden, you know, you, you, it look, yeah, it looks different. We're playing, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, I wish we were. <laughs> and the cues might look a little bit different, but just seeing the repetition of it yeah. and seeing it happen, like it just, it, 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 you learn things in a little bit of a different way. Like it's just, it's that much more, it's, it's another repetition that you're getting when you're not, you know, when you're not on the field yeah. and that's really big. Well, it seems like from the tactical side, a lot of what you were saying is translated into almost any movement, mm -hmm. whether finding a balance, keeping your head still. And I think mm -hmm. I've used the head still one as many times as I can now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would almost, I think, you know, I, I would say that kind of for me, the way that I think about it is, is the eyes go first a lot of the time, just because of the ability, like how quick you're able to move them. And I think that if you can get your eyes on, if you can get your eyes stilled, if you will, I'm sure that's a word on, you know, on a ball or a player or just a space a little bit quicker then your 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 brain and your body are going to follow quicker your hips are going to end up setting in a more open position some yeah. of the things you know that you mentioned and i think that's huge and i think that it's something that at the pro level you talk about like you know those margins and, and where you're training like those are some of the margins that you start to train in at the pro level in really sort of 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 you know deeper ways i should say we're at the college level yeah like i'm touching on that in college and i'm trying to reinforce it but i'm not going into the depth that i would yeah. you know at, at the pro level by any means mm. Well, let's talk about that pro level then. Yeah. Thank you, by the way. The ego, yeah. we can kind of push it off to the side now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. No, but I loved it. I think that's those are really good points that even myself, I was like, oh, damn, okay. I feel like I should have maybe, I probably have made that point once, but I didn't emphasize it enough. Mm -hmm. I think the eyes, for me, maybe I was always saying keep the head still. So mm -hmm. maybe in theory, you can say, yeah, the eyes are a part of the head. So maybe I was saying it, but I don't and think maybe I said it once and it worked and I'm like, that's it. You know what I mean? So there's <laughs> how crazy is that? Though? Yeah. As yeah. coaches, like we're influenced. I know mm -hmm. players as well. They hear us and they go, wow. Okay. That's something I really liked. Mm -hmm. And then for us as well, it's like, oh, wow. That's something, that's something oh, pretty cool there. Worked. All right. <laughs> Tuck that in my back pocket. Yeah. Uh, but so you go from, uh, again, the college game to the pro game. How did that uh, kind of, I guess, with the, the Casey situation kind of mm -hmm. present itself? Yeah, so I was I was coaching in college. I was working with a team that is now a USL two team, um, Minneapolis City in Minneapolis. So I was training men, which which was awesome. I loved it. You know, I had I had my own I have my own company. I was doing a lot of training through through them. So I was kind of doing everything. It had always I'd always wanted the opportunity to to go back to the pro game, and I'd started to have conversations about it kind of more frequently, more regularly, you know, I, I, there was people that I played with that were then now coaching and playing and still playing. Um, so I was just a little bit more intentional about going after it because it meant a big change. It meant moving away from my family and living on my own for, you know, a year. It meant, uh, it meant all of these things, but it was a step that I really wanted to take. Uh, and, and the opportunity came up because there was, you know, a couple of expansion teams happening and I had sort of been in conversations with, you know, with teams about positions and, and, I wasn't like a hundred percent that it's something that I really wanted to do. Do I want to move across the country from my family? Like, yeah. not really, but you know, if at the right opportunity, like, do I want to pursue this as part of my career? Yeah. So at one point, you know, is it kind of like quote unquote worth it? So I, I, I got to a point where like, yes, like we knew that it was going to, you know, it, we knew that it was going to mean living apart for a while. We knew that it was, you know, it was kind of going to be the next step. And, and once I kind of wrapped my head around that, I was able to, engaging conversations in a way that I think allowed me to really pursue that step. And I ended up, you know, I ended up getting a couple of offers with, you know, with NWSL teams. I ended up yeah, in Kansas City for a year. It was an incredible experience. We didn't do that well. I, I think it was the first year of a club that had a really unique situation where they just inherited a team and you're trying to build it in 40 days. I think mm. was, you know, but from, but from the time that they, that they got the team and the time that, you know, the season started, it was, it was a mad dash. Um, and in the midst of that, I'm in year one at a new, you know, at a new club in a, in a, at a new team and, and learning really, really quickly and trying to figure everything out as I go. And it was a great experience in that way, but there wasn't a lot of time, you know, to grow and develop. And there wasn't a lot of time to learn. It was like, you, you, you're going to hit the ground running and you got to do everything right straight off the bat. And I think that I grew a lot. I would hope that everybody's first year 
uh, at a new job or at the next level is kind of their worst year. That's kind of ideal, mm. right? So, and, you know, on one hand, it is a little bit hard to, to only have one year because was it's always going to be my worst year. But, you know, on the other hand, it's it was an incredible experience and I'm so much of a better coach because of it. So I really do appreciate, you know, what it was. What was that uh, that like now when you're, rec- you're realizing, oh, wow, okay, wins and losses here are important. And like you're saying, those margins are incredibly in tight now. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, uh, pro players, they just want to know that you're going to make them better. And they're going to get, because there's money on the line and there's jobs on the line. And the, the stakes are so much higher. And I think that I think that I was really concerned about proving myself. You know, on one hand, you're like, I know I'm good enough. How do I show them that I'm good enough? Um, I've got, you know, all these sessions and I've got, you know, and I'm learning a new season format and I'm learning a new preseason format and I'm learning a new system that we're playing in. And you're trying to apply all those things at once. And I'll say like there there were days where you spend hours. I was spending hours every night either with film, getting goalkeepers ready for a game that was coming up or, you know, developing a training session. And there are days that you go into the training session and it and it hits and it flows and you're like, yes, this is it. But in your first year, there are days you go into training session and it doesn't hit the way you want it to. And now it's like you're right back at square one with everything that, you know, I, I was the 25 year old that I was yeah. all of a sudden being like, why isn't this working? Trying to beat my head against the wall. And all those things existed in, you know, within the scope of one season like those were everything was there within the scope of one season but it was it's so cool working with that level of athlete there's something so great about it and they're so rewarding because they can they can communicate in ways that college goalkeepers can't you know they've they've done all of that they know the game so much better so the conversations that you're having are just at a different level and that's so much fun and it's something that i think is really really special And and i will say you know if we can kind of jump on a tangent i think that there's a really important space in the women's professional game i don't know exactly how it is on the men's side but there is only one goalkeeper coach at, at, at every club. Um, so unless you've been doing it for a long time, you don't necessarily have context for, for what you're doing. And I think that there's a really big need. So t- and tell me if you think if this is the case, just because of the academy system on the men's side where you've got multiple goalkeeper coaches in an environment that you don't have, I think, on the women's side. So you're, you're kind of operating in a vacuum because whether you're on the pro level or the college level or the youth level, the coach says, go train the goalkeepers and you go train the goalkeepers and then yeah. you, you, know, you join back up with the team. And I think that there's a really important step that can and should be taken for, for teams to have more than one goalkeeper coach. Whether it's the same system that kind of pops up and you've got youth teams under pro teams or club teams, uh, and, and you can just create an environment where there's literally more than one goalkeeper coach in, in a given environment because you are, you're operating within a vacuum. I think, you know, some of my my learning moments came from from being on the road or, or during games when I could, you know, grab a beer with another goalkeeper coach after after a game and sit and talk about goalkeeping. I never sat and talked about goalkeeping unless I was doing a podcast, <laughs> you know, during the yeah. season. And I think that there's a really important space that that could exist and doesn't yet but i hope i hope it does exist <laughs> soon yeah yeah it's tough i mean i've seen it even with uh, lafc academy uh, adrian who's with the academy side he has i don't know like four teams he has to work with so right. i think that he's kind of on an island on his own and every now and again when our season or our schedule kind of slowed down he and i could have a good conversation and discuss mm-hmm. things but still it, it it's on a lot of times like the goalkeeping side is a last position that's going to have a budget or yep. going to even do uh, anything to really improve it Mm -hmm. if that makes sense but i think that's where i think zooms or uh different things on like for this a podcast and stuff Mm -hmm. like that like you're saying listening to podcasts and seeing from someone's experience and recognizing like you said right there something that resonated with me was wow okay everybody has a bad session or everyone has those sessions where they question everything yeah and hearing that gives me perspective of like okay i can have a little bit more um empathy for myself in those moments Mm -hmm. and like understand yeah i don't ever want to feel this again but how do I, like we talked about earlier, compartmentalize yep. and then not only do that, but really build a skill set that's going to be able to combat this because these things come in waves. Mm-hmm. It could be two weeks, two months where everything's going amazing. And I had this recently where it was the end of the season, a game that didn't even matter. Mm-hmm. And we're playing against Galaxy 2 or Galaxy's MLX uh, Next Pro Team. I'm mm-hmm. um, getting the second goalkeeper ready to come in and I'm hitting crosses. And there's parents and stuff watching, nobody there really. Mm -hmm. And I'm kicking balls and I missed like three crosses in a row that maybe if there was somebody there to finish them, like a third goalkeeper could have shot them in. Sure, sure. But the ones where the goalkeepers are like, I'm just going to come out because these last two balls have been terrible. Right, right. And I remember finishing up the exercise, whatever. And again, maybe no one even cared, but I'm walking off the field going like, why was that such a disaster? What it? Yeah. What are you doing? And, and I think those are the moments where you start to recognize Okay, you hit one bad one, try it again. Mm-hmm. But if not, okay, what's the 
fallback plan maybe i just try and get some height with this one and mm-hmm. kind of like do a little bit of a curl so it lofts in the air it may not be game realistic yeah but the goalkeeper is getting something out of it and i'm walking out of it saying at least i had something to fall back on that gave me some foundation to continue to build forward yeah but you know what in in like three to five years whatever it is like that whole process that whole process is going to happen like that in your yeah. mind right where if it's year one and and whatever it is i hit three bad crosses in a row on game day warm-up i'm like I don't deserve to be here. Like, what, what am I doing? I need to leave, right? Where, like, you have to go through that whole process with with when, with when experience. Like, you know exactly what's going on. You know exactly how to change course. You know exactly how to fix things. And you know exactly how to deal with it. Yeah. Like, the the dealing with it and, and the being able to to adapt in whatever way you need to adapt. Like, that's experience. That takes time. Again, like, I think that there's a, a need to facilitate space for, for development and growth at the pro levels. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily think that, this might be controversial, but I don't necessarily think that you can take a, a good college coach and put them at the pro level and they're going to be a good pro coach i think it's it's a really different game in a lot of ways and i think the same thing exists for the goalkeeper coach you know i feel really lucky that i had experience on the on the men's semi-pro side i think that 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 really gave me a good you know a good introduction to, to coaching at the professional level in a way that i was prepared to go into it but it's a it's a hard thing to do unless you're in it in a really yeah. you know safe kind of way yeah did playing pro help with like absolutely yeah because i knew what the environment you know okay yeah should be like and i knew or i knew what i knew what i thought the environment should be like i had like i had a frame of reference for it and you're just around that type of player and and you know that all makes a difference for sure but it's such a different role to be playing when you're on you know when you're on one side of the touchline rather than the other so what's the solution how can we is it mentorship programs or for example we're both in la Mm -hmm. i'm like hey i'd like to come watch your session i'd like to come is that kind of how i think it's all of it it. yeah i think you know I, i think that you and like we and and the community's done a good job of creating you know a community for for goalkeepers i think that technology's really expanded you know what we've been able to be exposed to but there is nothing that's going to replace in my mind being on the field and learning on it's the same as being a player like you can watch as i i can get someone to watch as you know as much premier league or nwsl as i want and they're going to do a certain amount of learning within that environment but there's nothing that's going to replace the on-field you know exposure and i think that that I think that there's a real place and a real need for uh, mentorship and for on-field reps and for all of that in in the youth and the college and the professional game in, in a way that's just not there, at least on the women's side. I don't want to speak to the men's side because I don't know it as well. Yeah, it does in a sense. I mean, but maybe for me it was more so because I'm so tied into the media side of things mm-hmm. that I've kind of taken a lot of the information that I get from podcasts, from YouTube videos, from even podcasts that I've done myself, Mm -hmm. where I speak to somebody, they give me this little nugget of information, and then I sleep on it, I think about it a lot, and then I realize, oh boy, okay, that's something I can really implement. Mm -hmm. And then through trial and error of my own implementation, I'm recognizing, wow, I've had a breakthrough here, or I need to work on this a little bit more. So I would say for me, it's been more of internalizing, Mm -hmm. but because that's the only way. So if there was more, like you're saying, more of an outlet, or even more of hey, we're going to have a session today and mm-hmm. like clubs were okay with other coaches and other people coming to watch. Yeah. I understand just, you know, keeping things uh, discreet, sure. but still I think it's important yeah. to have that. And one thing for me is, for example, LAFC last year, I didn't really have that open door policy because the goalkeeper coach that was there, I don't know what it was. Maybe he didn't like me. I don't know what it is, but yeah. like I would ask him to come watch sessions. Impossible. And, I don't know. Because <laughs> I haven't had him on the podcast yet. Maybe that's what it is. But he was just kind of like, no i'm gonna do my thing and like if you wanted to watch you can watch from the side and i had that kind of like a little bit of a stiff arm Mm -hmm. so it kind of like closed me off but then i speak to guys like phil wedden paul rogers chris sharp for example todd hofford guys who i know jill lloyden Mm -hmm. people who i've spoken to and they're so open to giving information that i kind of said oh boy okay maybe i could just keep on knocking and some people are just not going to be open to it but keep on knocking on those doors because people are willing to give you the information you just have to ask totally and i would say that i've you know i i think that especially the way that that jill and tki approach you know approach the sharing of information um i i think there's an incredible amount of knowledge i think that you know just giving a shout out to them she's done an incredible job with just opening up her ideas and her philosophy to to players and to coaches you know i i would love to go to all of phil weddens you know yeah. conventions and and but you know sometimes that's not accessible to people so so the sharing of information is big absolutely i think the in-person part i think that you know if you do have the ability to go to uh, what is what is phil's thing called the ig igcc yeah yeah that acronym um, if you do <laughs> i think i think that's probably an incredible experience right but creating being able to create that 
in whatever you have available to you, um, I think is really important. And I think that it is possible for teams to to recognize, for clubs, maybe organizations, if you will, to recognize the importance of, of growth. You're never just going to have one coach. You're never going to have one assistant coach, yeah. you know. So so I maybe, you know, why would you just have one goalkeeper coach if there's a way to to kind of build, you know, something something bigger and something better that's going to, you know, long-term allow allow a lot of development yeah just because it's the way it's been done for years doesn't mean it's totally. the only solution yeah yeah and i want to get you out on this last question yeah and uh i ask people different questions at the end so this one's probably the first one i'm ever gonna ask to anybody so okay. uh, special um but if you were let's say watching this interview back mm-hmm. in 10 years what is something from your coaching but also like personal life and like mm-hmm. kind of how you see the and view the world that you want to improve on that in 10 years you look yeah. back and say wow okay i really made i would say leaps and bounds but i've really improved on that where do i want to grow yeah um i mean hopefully you know my hopefully my body of work in 10 years allows me to approach an interview like this with a lot with better stories (laughs) um, and great examples of of championships and whatnot i think that i'm always going to care a lot about communication and delivering information and being really well spoken i think that that's a tool that I struggled with, that I struggle with less now, that in 10 years I want to be really, really good at. And and yeah, being being intentional with my words, being concise with my words, it's not something I'm good at. Even <laughs> I'm, I'm better, but I'm not good at it. Um, and I think that, yeah, if I was going to look at this in 10 years, I would just want to just be even more, you know, even more dialed in to, to being able to communicate in really good, effective ways. First part of that is self-awareness to mm-hmm. know what you want to work on. And then as you progress, then you start adding the little tools that you need and totally. experiences that you need and the more feedback and stuff that you get from different people, all this kind of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But again, like the feedback, right? Where does, where does that come from, right? Yeah. Like it, you got you to gotta have something around you to be able to, to get that feedback from. I think that's huge. For sure. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start creating something. We'll, we'll make something let's happen. Go. But <laughs> yes. um, anything else? No, thank you. Thank you for, you know, doing this and sharing your time. You know, we talk about we talk about creating space for growth. And I think that this is an incredible space for growth. So thank well, you. we've had conversations, you and I before, and I, I like the way you were articulate. I like the way that you have your experiences and kind of how you've tailored those experiences into what, the way you coach. So I've always had the idea of if I did start this, you'd be one of the people on there. So I'm happy I'm, and I appreciate you coming. I know it's kind of in the middle of nowhere in LA here. So I appreciate that. Oh, it's great. It was just no, <laughs> no traffic on the tent today. It was, it was pretty That's, easy. <laughs> I, I didn't do that and clear anything for you, but I'm happy it was like that. It's a good that. day when there's no traffic on the tent. Yeah. Well, Allie, thank you so much, and hopefully we'll have you again on soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right.